Praise God, it's coming soon. something real, something special, because he died to transform us, not only bring us to heaven, but to transform us now. Many of you who are saved, you ask this question, where would you be if Jesus hadn't loved you? If he hadn't transformed you, if he hadn't made you his child, where would you be tonight? But thank God, thank God you're saved. And if you are you are here tonight or aren't saved, I want to say the devil wants to wreck your life. He wants to destroy it. But Jesus came to bring you life. Life more abundant. Where would I be if Jesus hadn't loved me? Where would I be if Jesus didn't care? And let's sing this little chorus out that we've been learning for upcoming gospel mission.
the one this evening who sits upon the throne, looks upon us, knows us, loves us. Let's enter in and glorify his great name for giving to us his precious son, the saviour of the world. Lord, for what we've been already singing tonight, lifting your name high. And you, Father, you've said that if we lift your name high, that you'll draw all men unto you. And Father, as we sing about the cross tonight, surely our hearts are lifted up 
realizing, Father, that you came to this sinful world, took upon human flesh, and became so low, coming to that old rugged cross and shedding your precious blood that we might walk free. And Father, we pray for this gospel meeting tonight, that you've given us another opportunity whereby we can hurl this great message that Jesus saves. And Lord, we pray as your word is open tonight, and Lord, as it is expounded, we pray, Lord, that you would indeed speak to those who know not Christ. And for those of us who know you, Father, that this would be a night once again when we would realize and know what it means to have our sins forgiven, to have our names written in heaven, and to, to know within our hearts that it is well with our soul. We pray, for Lord, for our brother whom you've brought into our midst as well, who will come and testify of God's saving and amazing grace. We pray, Lord, that you would indeed help him. And Lord, as we hear of the testimony that he would share to us tonight, Lord, that we would see again the goodness and the greatness of our God. We pray, Lord, for every family that is represented here. We pray, Lord, for any needs and wants. For any difficulties, we pray, Lord, that you would meet them at the very point of their need. Those who are, are, who are unwell, those who are elderly, those who are perhaps are awaiting treatment or diagnosis. Lord, we pray that they would know that underneath and all around are the everlasting arms of their heavenly Father. So, Father, we pray that you would go before us tonight. Keep your gracious hand upon us, we pray, in our Saviour's precious and ever worthy name. Amen. Amen. copy of God's Word, could you turn with me to Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, and as you turn there, can we give each one of you a very warm word of welcome, and we do thank you for coming to join with us this evening. Just to remember a few announcements in this incoming week, uh, we have got our Men of the Word Bible Study Group which is tomorrow at 8 p.m. Tomorrow at 8 p.m. And each one, each of the men here are invited to join uh, just in the back hall. Then Tuesday is our early morning prayer meeting at 7 a.m. And then our Zoom prayer meeting at 10 a.m. There is no footsteps owing to the midterm break. Wednesday is our Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m. Thursday is our ladies meeting at 8 p.m. Whenever Sandra Matthews will be alone uh, to bring God's word. And then Friday is Lifeliners at 7 p.m. And then next Sunday is Sunday School and Bible Classes at 10.30 a.m. Our Sunday morning service at 11.30 a.m. And then there's something big, big happening next Sunday evening. And the big event that's happening next Sunday evening is our Be In Time Gospel Mission. And we hope that next Sunday evening that you can join with us as we commence this two-week evangelism crusade with our brother John Weir. Please take leaflets, please hand them out, please be in prayer in this incoming week for a move of Almighty God. And so please keep that just in your thoughts. Um, let's join together for Luke chapter 23, Luke 23 and verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him, that is Jesus, unto Pilate. Verse 23, and they were instant with louder voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. In verse 32, And there were also two other malefactors led with them to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. We're going to sing just two verses uh, of our next hymn, and then we are so glad that Derek has come along this evening to share his life story, his testimony. And straight after these two verses, I'm going to invite Derek uh, up to share with us what God has been doing in his life.
Well, good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be along uh, to my gospel this evening to tell you something of what the Lord Jesus Christ means to me and what he has done for me in my life. I don't know many faces. I know one or two scattered among the congregation tonight. I want to ask you a question at the very outset. Have you ever repented of your sin? I wonder, has there been a time or a place in your life whenever you have repented of your sin? Could tonight you get up here and give a word of testimony of God's forgiveness in your life? I just want to read part of a verse. You don't really need to turn to it. I'm sure for many as will know it. Psalm 138, verse 8. In many ways, this is my motto. Um, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. I don't know about you, but David stands out in Scripture as one that I often turn to whenever I think of the book of Psalms. There's many times that David writes such verses, and you know, we can turn to them in times whenever we just need that word from God. We can cry out like him and many times, perhaps it's the Lord is my light and my salvation. I don't know what it is for you. But in this verse it says, the Lord, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Child of God, he knows all about you tonight. I was born into what many would call a good home, a stable home. I had a mother that was saved. And you know, we're brought up in a little place called Mother Glass. Not a geography lesson, that's about three miles outside of Newry, for any of you that never have heard of Mullet Glass. It hasn't changed probably much from whenever I was born there. And there's about 60 houses, and that's where me and my three brothers and my sister were brought up in a loving home. Not only did I live there, well, I went to school there, and I also went to Sunday school and to church. And I thank God for that upbringing that I had as I look back um, on it. I thank God for parents who loved me and provided everything that I required. As a small child, um, my brother and myself, my older brother and myself, were collected, I think it was a Wednesday evening, by a neighbour. This neighbour had a concern for the souls of those boys and girls that lived in the community. And you know, he used to pack us into his little car and drove us down the, the, the road uh, toward Newry. On the side of the road there, there was a little wooden hut didn't hold that many, but we were squeezed in there, many, many children. And for me, that was the first time that I can recall ever hearing the great stories of the Bible, learning the little choruses. And I suppose as a child, I was maybe only four years old at the time. I have to say there wasn't an awful lot maybe sunk into my heart. But you know, I thank God for that. As I say, I had a faithful mother. She saw to it each Sunday morning that me and my brother walked the distance from our house down to the church there in Muller Glass. Didn't matter what the weather was like, didn't matter whether there was, there was rain or there was snow on the ground, that was our Sunday routine. You know, I recall very vividly in my mind the first time that God ever spoke to me as an individual. I had a Sunday school teacher that taught me from God's Word. He taught me that I was a sinner. From God's Word, he taught me that wonderful story in the book of Genesis, how that sin had entered the world. You know, he just didn't leave it there. He told me the remedy for sin, how that the Lord Jesus Christ had come to die upon the tree for me. I have to say, that was an opportunity for me to repent, but I passed by on it. I was only a child, but I knew I was lost. I knew that I was a sinner. I hadn't committed the crimes that people might go to prison for. But I was still separated from God because of my sin. I understood that I needed to be saved. I wonder tonight, do you understand that? Have you sat three gospel meetings where you realise that you're a sinner, that you're lost, and yet with all you've never repented? Maybe you're a little older in the meeting tonight and you can remember your Sunday school days. Perhaps you had a faithful Sunday school teacher who taught you scripture, perhaps had a burden for your soul. Maybe you remember the verses, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As you sit where you are in the meeting this evening, I wonder... What have you done with those opportunities that has been afforded to you tonight? Perhaps you have passed them by and tonight you have no time for God. Your life is full of so much that you think is more important than God. Perhaps it's your job, your family, 
Perhaps it's a hobby, I don't know. But maybe tonight those opportunities as God has supported you throughout your life, you've rejected him. You know, we're not to take these things for granted. Doesn't it remind us in the book of Genesis that my spirit will not always strive with man. Tonight, you know, friend, if God is speaking into your life tonight, perhaps he's been speaking to you before this mission starts here. You've been spoken too many times. Don't turn away. Thank God for another opportunity to repent of your sin. Whenever I was eight years old, we moved house because of my father's occupation. And we moved to Tandragui. I suppose it took us a little while to get settled there, but not many weeks passed by until we were invited along to a good news club held in a house uh, by a few ladies in the park. You know, I look back and I'm thankful for the influence of those ladies on my young life. They were faithful in teaching us God's word as children uh, in and around the park at that time. And then it wasn't long until it became the routine in our house that again we were sent along to Sunday school and to church. It was one of those mornings in December of 1982 that God spoke to me. I'd been to Sunday school and I don't remember anything about it, to tell you the truth. But what I remember is that Sunday morning, my minister at that time was the Reverend Mr. Austin Allen, and he'd been preaching through the book of Revelations. That morning he spoke about, about hell. I can't give you points regarding a sermon tonight, but what I do remember is that anything in my life that I thought was good enough to get me into heaven, well, I was completely stripped back that morning. I have no hope of heaven if I were to die. I have nothing in my life that would ever take me to heaven. I was a sinner and I was lost. The thing that stands out in my mind about that morning is that he spoke of the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm sure many of you here have heard of it. The Book of the Revelation, in verse 8, chapter 21, it tells us, of those names that won't be found in it. Then the verse 27, it says this, and there shall in no wise enter into it, that's having anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's a great book. And that book is the name of every believer who has truly sought forgiveness and repented of their sin. And much to my shame that morning, I knew that my name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, there's no other way to have your name in it. You have to come to that place where you repent of your sin. Thank the Lord Jesus Christ for dying on the cross, shedding his precious blood so that your name could be added there. You know, you need to admit that you're a sinner. We don't like to admit things. The older we get, the stronger we become. Well, we're all sinners. I went home that Sunday from church and that afternoon I'd been in my bedroom and God spoke, spoke on to me clearly. The reality, the consequences of my sin gripped me as an eight-year-old boy. See, friend, the gospel isn't for adults in the meeting. Young people, children in the meeting, God can save you just where you are tonight as well. I was a nine-year-old boy. I have to say, I couldn't quote much of the Bible. I never prayed audibly in my life before. You know, that afternoon, God moved in my heart. I thank him for it. The Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin, and in childlike faith, I repented and gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. There wasn't flesh and light. There wasn't thunder. But friend, there was contentment and peace that came into my life as a boy that day. And I'm thankful to God for his goodness, for his faithfulness to me in saving me. You know, if you'll only seek the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, he's able and willing to forgive you of your sin. Perhaps tonight as you sit, you think you're not good enough to be saved. Friend, that's the starting point for each and every truly repentant sinner. There's not one of us good enough. We could never give enough. We could never work hard enough to get to heaven. We have to come the way we are. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That didn't make me a perfect person. I've failed the Lord many, many times over my life. Sadly to say, growing up, I grew, grew cold at heart. I'm thankful that he kept me from the things of this world. 
I had great Christian company in my youth fellowship there in Tandragi, and many youth rallies that, that kept us on the path, as it were. And God's been good to me in my life. I praise and thank him above all for salvation tonight. You know, he is the one that keeps. God is faithful. In a world where we see so much unfaithfulness, whether it's in our political world, perhaps even in the church, God is faithful. He is dependable. He's the only one that is dependable. Tonight, God bless. I can say God has blessed me abundantly. Blessed me with a good wife. Blessed me with three children. And God be the glory that each of them are saved. I thank God for household salvation. There's a little hymn, and I'm sure I've heard the good singing at the commencement of the meeting, and I'm sure you folks here will have known it. It's a little hymn, and it says, I thank God for the mountains. And then it goes on to say that I thank him for the valleys. Tonight I want to thank God for my valley experiences. Sometimes when we come out the other side of the valley, it's that time that we need to step back and thank God for it. And as I speak here tonight, I'm convinced that there are a lot of people who are going through problems and difficulties, perhaps unknown to many. And sadly, in the world in which we live, because of sin, that is not unique. We all go through times of trouble. I am so thankful as a child of God. If you're a child of God tonight, isn't it wonderful not to go through our trials alone? Because we've got God. Remember the little verse that we read at the commencement. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. It's been said by somebody that a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but it's hard to understand why difficult things come into our lives. And of course, we're all unique and we react differently. As it was once said to me, we can be very impatient, confused, afraid. There's so much emotion inside each of us. Sometimes we don't react the way a child of God should. We react perhaps like the, the children of Israel whenever they saw the Egyptians closing in on them. They lost all composure. You know, God had every right to turn his back on them. The children at that time, they'd forsaken him. But God is faithful. He never left them. And in his own time, he intervened in a miraculous way. Perhaps many of you in the meeting can testify to that tonight. It's wonderful to have a heavenly father that we can turn to. I have to say, it's not something that I like to admit, but I wasn't ready for a trial that entered my life back in 2017. Back in 2017, my faith was tested in a way that I had not been prepared for. Like I say, it's, it's always the way. It comes in unexpectedly. We're sitting tonight in this meeting and none of us knows what to, this week will hold for any of us. September of 17, my life was good. As like I say, I was married with three children at the time and was Alison and my desire to bring our children up in the things of God. And so it was that we sent our children to Sunday school on a Sunday morning as we lived outside of St. I always drove the children down. Alison got them ready on a Sunday morning. I drove them down, came back up again to get myself ready for church. That Sunday morning was no different. And that morning as I put my top button into my shirt, I noticed a swelling just to the left-hand side of my neck. I have to say I did, did feel unwell, felt very fit. I had been working. I remember saying to Alison about it. And I don't know what it is about women's situation, but they give good advice to us of men, even though sometimes they don't like to admit it. Remember Alison saying, Derek, I think you'd be better maybe getting that seen to this week, get an appointment made with the GP. That Sunday we went to church, we enjoyed fellowship together. And the Monday morning I went to work, and like all good husbands do, I did as I was asked to do. I made an appointment with the GP. Thankfully, it was the days before COVID when you phoned your GP, you got an answer, and I got an appointment for that Wednesday. And on the Wednesday, I went to the GPs and remember well that she did a thorough examination. And she said, Derek, I think that this will require more testing. So it was, she wrote me out a referral. And I went down to the Ulster Clinic that evening and got an ultrasound scan. 
The consultant looked at it and obviously he wouldn't give me a definitive diagnosis, but he believed that it would require more tests and perhaps treatment. October of that year, 2017, brought surgery and more scans. I have to say it wasn't a particularly easy time for us. But during this time, I want to testify tonight to God's goodness, God's faithfulness. I never attended once an appointment. I never went to the hospital where God didn't comfort us through his word. There were times when things fell into place that were beyond man's control. Outside of my control. But God was in control. Well, all those tests, operation, etc. all ended up in me being diagnosed with non Hodgson lymphoma. And I have to be honest and say whenever I was told that I had cancer, I felt my world was falling apart. I have to say I looked. I looked the part. I looked fit. I looked healthy. I was saved. I have no doubt that I was saved. But I have to say, I wasn't prepared for the news that I got. I felt my world had fallen apart. I had concerns, concerns for Alison. Of course, concerns for the children. Legitimate questions for God. Asking God why. But you know, God's peace is a wonderful thing. It wasn't long after I was diagnosed that I was reminded, reminded of a little course that was sent to me in a card. I do not know what lies ahead, the way I cannot see. But one stands near to be my guide, he'll show the way to me. I do not know the course ahead, what joys and griefs there are. But one stands near who fully knows I'll trust his loving care. I know who holds the future, he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things just don't happen, everything by him is planned. So as I face tomorrow, with his problems large and small, I'll trust the God of miracles, give to him my all. Like I say, things weren't easy. It would be a lie to say that we were sailing along with this news. But friend, to know that the path that we were on, the path that I was on at that time was a perfect plan for my life. God had allowed this to happen to us. December of 17, God has seen us as we commenced our chemotherapy. I'm thankful to God for his goodness through those following months, how that he protected us and brought us through. We're praising, we're praising tonight for being in remission uh, for these years. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. You know, there's times that every one of us will go in through that furnace in this life. For you, it might be different. It might not be cancer, but there will be something. But you know, sometimes we're permitted to go through them furnaces to refine us, to draw us closer to him. For me, as I look back on it now, I'm thankful to God. I'd never had time off from work like it. It was nine months of, out of work. Alice on the way to work, the children away to school. Some men might say that sounds blissful. I can look back and say it was blissful. Not because they weren't there, but because God was real to me. I'd never spent as much time in his word. My recovery was good. I went back to work again. It wasn't that overly long, many more years, until I ended up in another furnace. Back in 2020, thankfully it's a thing of the past, but not to go into it too deeply, but I ended up as one of the first candidates with COVID and then hospitalised with it. I would have to say, friend, it was one of the most difficult times of my life. I had been I began to get quite ill, and Alison had phoned out of ours. Doctor, on one of the weekends, I ended up down in Ulster Hospital. She dropped me off at the door, and unknown to me, it was five weeks before I would see her or the children again. My condition deteriorated quite rapidly to the point I was in intensive care uh, for over the week. It was one of those nights in intensive care. You know, I was always brought up. I always heard people saying, you know, there's no fear of death. It's wonderful to know that you're going home, and it is. I remember one evening, I think it was an evening, I could hardly remember much about the experience at times, but it was one of those evenings whenever I was lying in intensive care, and I have to tell you, I was worried. I realized my life was ebbing away. I was suffocating. I had worries about the children, worries about Alison. 
That night my soul cried out to God for him to presence himself with me. You know, there in that place, God gave me such a peace that I can never fully ever explain to anybody. It was a peace that passes all understanding. My recovery was slow, but you know, God was faithful. He answered prayer to be part of a family. Child of God, isn't it a wonderful thing to be part of a family for people who pray for one another? To belong to a church that prays for each other. It's something that the world knows nothing about. The peace and the contentment that brings to the soul. Needless to say, I lived uh, through that experience as well. And I have to say, God's hand has been good upon me. There's never been a time in my life that he has left me. Friend, tonight I haven't come to give you an update on my medical uh, conditions. What I've come here tonight to tell you is no matter what circumstances in life you face, if you're saved, God will go through it with you. It's not me that's faithful. God is faithful. Perhaps you've been looking to man in your life to find some type of peace. You won't find it. You won't find it in this church. But you will find it in the gospel that is preached from this pulpit. You know, friends, someday I will leave this scene of time. I'm not sure when that will be. None of us know. For me, it may be cancer. It could be as easily a car crash. I was thinking as I was coming down the road, I passed a spot where a dear friend lost his life. About 12 years ago this week, David Black passed away into eternity. Shot on the motorway as he went to work. That morning we waited for David as he was supposed to arrive in work. He didn't arrive. Friend, I wonder tonight if your soul was be required of you tomorrow morning. Where would you spend eternity? Have you ever let that question really get down deep inside your mind into your heart? The Lamb's Book of Life. Your, your name needs to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Eternity is sure. It's heaven, it's hell. That's from God's Word. Tonight, if you're not saved, sadly, you will never be in heaven. Can I just urge you tonight, if you don't know my Saviour, tonight will you come and put your trust in him? Don't put it off. Don't wait to the mission next week. Perhaps you're thinking of waiting to that mission start. Don't put it off. Get saved tonight. I recommend my friend to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek, for the blessing that has been to us and the challenge from the testimony. Derek has shared that those few closing remarks with you, of course, not to scare you, but to bring re great reality. That you do not know when your final hour is. That it could be tomorrow. Uh, we were out knocking doors on Tuesday. And I knocked a door in Magashal on Tuesday evening and no response. And on Wednesday morning, that man was gone. The reality that each one of us are facing death. And so we trust that if you don't know Derek's saviour, our saviour, that we present them to you this evening. That you'll take them and you'll take them home with you. Let's join together for our next hymn before we just close with a few thoughts from God's word. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. And perhaps we could just sing the first two verses with change of position. And we'll stand if you can.
back to Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, I just really want to leave with you one a portion of a verse that you might bring home with you and think upon it. It is Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. Luke 23 and verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Dr. Luke brings us to one of the most pivotal moments in all of history. He brings us to a little nation called Israel. He brings us to a city called Jerusalem. He brings us to a hill called Golgotha. He brings us right into the very heart of God, to Calvary. And here we find this evening Jesus is bringing all of history to one defining moment, Calvary. And we read, there they crucified him. And in that moment, God leaned over his throne. And all of the angels stepped back in awe and in reverence as they came to that place called Calvary. And Jesus was emphasizing one truth to us in that moment. Luke is looking us to take home one central point. That Jesus embraced death. That you might embrace eternal life. Jesus embraced death. That you might embrace eternal life. And we read in verse 23, and they... Who are the they? Who are the voices in our text shouting, crucify him? Who are these angry people who are flexing their muscles at the Son of God? In a broader sense, they, they represent all of humanity. It represents each one of us. For there on Skull Hill on Calvary, stood the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the movers and shakers of the temple. They feel so threatened by Jesus. They felt their authority slipping away. They was just the general people. People who in a moment of fear and frenzy chose to turn against Jesus rather than stand up for what is right. And if we had have been there, if you had have been there, it's a sobering thought that you would have been leading the chant, crucify him, crucify him. But what was it about that moment? What is it about this man called Jesus that would have swayed us to join in and shout, crucify him, crucify him? I believe it's pride. Pride makes it hard to admit when we're wrong. Pride makes it hard to admit when we're wrong. Pride, it urges us to cut ties with those who call us out on our wrong. Isn't that what we find with the Pharisees? Pride had blinded them to their need of repentance. It was pride that forced them to distance themselves from Jesus. They couldn't admit they were wrong. Even when Jesus confronted them in Luke 18 with the parable of the prideful tax collector, they just shook it off and they turned their back on Jesus. Friend, pride keeps us. Pride does keep you from acknowledging that Jesus Christ took the penalty. He took the guilt. He took the shame that belonged to me, that belonged to you. Pride says, I am not the reason I am not to blame that Jesus had to die. Pride says, I don't need this man to get into heaven. I can find some other way. As I said, we, we as a church have been in these past week, past week, Tuesday and Thursday, out in door to door outreach. Some of you have been slipping in through letterboxes, other, others of you have been knocking doors. And one of the most common responses to the question that I received this week to the question, why should God allow you into heaven? 
as I asked the folk in Magasha Lab this week, the response that I got the most was, I haven't done anyone any harm. And if I asked you, why should God allow you into heaven? How would you respond honestly in light of your situation? Because if you're not a Christian, I would dare to suggest, I'll make a bold claim, it's pride that's keeping you back from admitting you're wrong. I haven't done anyone any harm. In other words, you're saying, Jesus didn't really have to die for me. Pride at its core is fear. Fear of being exposed, fear of being rejected, fear of losing control. And like the Pharisees, do you find yourself this evening hiding behind a cloak, a blanket of self-righteousness? I'm not the reason. This man, Jesus, had to leave heaven and die upon Calvary, but you were, friend. You were. Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, and pride makes it hard to admit when we're wrong. But are you? Are you going to let pride keep you out of heaven? Or will you humble yourself before Almighty God and take responsibility for your sin and say like David in Psalm 51 verse 4 against thee? And thee only have I sinned. Jesus, here he is embracing death in this moment so that you could embrace eternal life. And the truth is, the more we resist admitting our wrongs and admitting we need Jesus, the harder our hearts grow. Look at our text, our phrase in our text, in verse 33, and when they were come. This wasn't a spur of the moment decision or something that just happened randomly overnight. This event was the accumulation of a gradual process for three years. The people had continually hardened their hearts and the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. And for three years they had resisted God's conviction, ignored the truth and let stubbornness take root. And Jesus at one stage in Mark 3, he spoke out against their hardness and spiritual blindness. And so by the time we arrive at Calvary, their hearts were so hardened that they chose to crucify the very saviour that was sent to redeem them. You know, one of the most powerful and biblical examples uh, of someone hardening their heart is Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Despite God coming to Pharaoh and challenging him and convicting him to turn from his sin, we read that Pharaoh hardened his heart over and over again. And Solomon said, He that had been often reproved hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Derek has spoke about it. You do not know the moment that you close your eyes at night, sleep like a little baby, and wake up in a lost eternity. He that oft been often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly, suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. There's an old and wise tale about frogs I was reading this week, that if you throw a frog in boiling water, it'll jump out. But if you put it in cold water and slowly heat it, it won't notice the danger until it's too late. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go to find the first frog and to try that experiment. But that's an old wise tale. This, and this gradual deadening is how many people end up spiritually hardened. You come to church, you hear a testimony that speaks to you. You feel convicted of your sin. And you walk out through the doors. And little by little you become comfortable with the voice of God. And I have found it in my Christian service that people who keep turning their back upon God eventually can become numb to God's voice. And that is why God is calling you. That is why he's speaking to you tonight. That's why you feel that conviction in your heart that God is drawing you to himself. And so now the people, they arrive at Calvary. They have beaten, they have whipped, they have mocked, abused the very son of God who had created them. And they come, this phrase has just caught me this week, they, when they were come to Calvary, a place of public execution, 
where Jesus has been forced to carry his own cross, which was the Roman way of showing that the criminal was being able to feel forced into submission to the Roman authority. Jesus was being driven into submission. But Jesus had to show no such submission. He said he would lay down his life by his own authority. He would lay down his life because of you. Because of you. Do you recognize and do you understand how much Jesus loves you? And we read in verse 23, and they crucified him. Do you feel this evening the weight of those words? And they crucified him. Who is the him? Three letters. Who is the him? The him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The him who walked on earth as a man. Who was a teacher, who was a healer, who was a friend to the outcast. Him who was fulfilling Old Testament prophecies, him. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Three letters, such powerful meaning, him. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, him. Not just a man, but the God-man. Truly God, truly man. Him. No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. Him. And here he stands before the Roman army, the occupying force at that time, knowing that Roman citizens were generally exempt from crucifixion. It was so shameful and cruel and horrifying that Rome generally spared its worst criminals from this horrific death. But Jesus was just a Jew. I mean, to the Romans, he's just a common man. One who was trying to lead a resistance against Rome. But one who Pilate said, I find no fault within him. And now they get the Son of God, the one who'd flung stars into spear. And they sat down a Roman cross, splintered, hard Roman cross. And they lay the very back of Jesus upon it. Can you see him? With outstretched hands, they drive nails through his wrist. Those hands that are giving you your life breath. And they lift that cross up into the air. And they drive those nails through his heel bone. Can you picture with me, imagine standing at the foot of the cross. Imagine seeing this man wearing a crown of thorns. Imagine seeing him being hoisted up. Imagine asking yourself a question. Is Jesus dying a death that I deserve? Is Jesus so 